cost of worship. I think a lot of times as Christians, we, we underestimate the power of worship in our lives. And if you want to know about the power, we're going to touch on it a little bit today. But next week, we're going to be looking at that even more. We underestimate the power of worship, but I think as Christians, oftentimes, we underestimate the value of worship. We underestimate how precious worship truly is. So that's the part of worship that we're going to look at today. So if you're in John chapter 12, verse 8, say amen. All right, let's read this passage of scripture. The Bible says in John 12, 1, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus who, uh, was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Remember, he had died. He was dead for three days. Jesus came, brought, brought him back to life. And now here he is sitting there with Jesus at the table. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box. And he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Father, we come to you at this time, Lord, and we thank you, God, because your word has so much precious truth. Lord, it's through the word of God that we've come to realize our great need for Jesus Christ. And it's through, Lord, your incredible word that we learn to grow in Christ. And Father, I pray that, God, you would teach us something from your word today, something real, something powerful, something that will change us. Lord God, I just come and I offer myself, Lord, as a vessel to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would use my life, anoint me, Lord God, with words, God, that are powerful, words that are convicting, words that will bring healing. God, I pray that you'd speak life into your body. Lord God, let this come forth from your word and by your spirit and just use me as a vessel, God. I pray this and I ask this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Have you ever heard this story before in John chapter 12 about Mary and this precious oil that she brought to the feet of Jesus? We're going to look at this passage of scripture and I want to teach you uh, the cost of worship, how precious, how valuable worship is. So the first point I'm going to share with you here is worship is priceless. Something we need to know and understand about the worship that we offer to God is that worship is priceless. This is what that scripture had said, for it was possible to have sold this perfume for more than 300 denarii. The Amplified tells us that's a laboring man's wages for a year. And to have given the money to the poor, and they censured and they reproved her. They judged her for her worship. I want you to think about how precious, how valuable this act of worship was that Mary was presenting to Jesus Christ. In this day and age, the average agricultural worker received one denarii a day. This actually comes from a, a passage of scripture in Matthew 20 where the Bible tells us, now when he had agreed with the laborers for denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. It was one penny a day. That's what they made. So we look at it not like a lot of money, but back then that was a day's wage. And so they would work a 12-hour day, and they would get this one penny, this one denarii. One pence or one denarii is about, to us, it would be about 17 U.S. cents. So if you multiply that throughout a whole year, it would, it would be about $51. And they could live on that. They could live. 2,000 years ago, they could live on $51 a year. Imagine that. I mean, wow, have prices really inflated or what? And you think about that over the years, and let me give you a couple of other examples throughout the years. My, my grandparents in 1964, they built a house just about five miles from here in Columbia Heights. And my, my grandmother and grandfather built this three-bedroom house right off of 49th Avenue in Central, and uh, it cost them $17,000 to build the house. At that time, in 1964, my grandmother was making a dollar a day. I'm sorry, a dollar an hour was her wage. And now we, we come up to this time frame, and actually back in 1999, I was in India, and when I was in India, I found out that in the villages that we were in, the average household lived on a dollar a day, 
$300 a year. They could live and support a family with a dollar a day. And so now we're up in our day and age, and it's still hard sometimes for us to put this into perspective, like how costly and how precious this oil was in this alabaster box that Mary had brought to Jesus. I've actually heard some uh, pastors say that it was the equivalent of an entire year's wage. For, so you, for, for you and I, that would be at least $30,000 a year. She brings this precious ointment, this precious perfume. She brings this expensive alabaster box to the feet of Jesus, breaks it upon him. She allows the oil to flow down his head. She is crying at his feet. She's wiping his feet with her hair. I mean, Jesus is precious to her. He's priceless. He's costly. I mean, there's no way to even begin to compare the value of Jesus to anything else. So it's no big thing for her to bring something that's worth $30,000 and pour it at the feet of Jesus. And people are looking around her and they're saying, that's wasteful. What is she doing? That could have been used to give to the poor. What is this woman doing? That is so costly. They reproved her. They judged her. But we understand something from the story that we need to get in our own spirit, something that we need to learn in our own personal life, is that worship is priceless. Do we really understand the worth of the one that we worship? Do we understand the worth of the one that we worship? I believe that if we begin to understand in our spirit, we really deeply understand the one that we worship and how worthy he is of our worship, I believe that our lives will change in regards to worship. There's a couple of stories I want to tell you about a great worship leader in the Bible, great worshiper by the name of David. So if you have your Bible, go over to 2 Samuel 24. We're going to go back in a moment to that, that main passage of Scripture in John 12. But there's two stories I want to tell you about David. And the first one is found in 2 Samuel 24. Now, while you're turning there, I want to kind of give you a little background on uh, what was going on at this time in David's life. He was at the end of his leadership in Israel. He was about ready to die, and he did something that really displeased the Lord. He did something that was wrong in the sight of God. And so a prophet by the name of Gad had come to him, and he gave him three options. And these were the three options. One was that the people of God could endure seven years of famine. Oh, that doesn't sound very good. Or David could run from his enemies for three months while they chased after him. Well, he had plenty of that in the past. I don't think that sounded like a viable option. And the last one was three days of a plague. And so this judgment was coming upon David for something that, if you actually read about it in 2 Samuel, you wouldn't actually think that it was that, that, that bad, what he did. But it really displeased God. And so these were the, the three choices, judgments that had come against him. And so he went ahead and he chose the three days of plague. And 70,000 people in Israel got wiped out. Because David was so brokenhearted because of this sin, because he had a very high responsibility in leadership. And here he was grieving the heart of God with some of the things that he was doing in Israel at the time. And so he repented of this and he wanted to return to a heart of worship. He wanted to return into a right standing with God. He wanted to return from whatever his prideful and selfish ways were. And so I want to pick up in this story here in 2 Samuel 24, verse 18. And look at this passage of Scripture, thinking about how priceless worship is. The prophet Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of uh, Araha, Ara, uh, Arana, I'm sorry, the Jebusite. This crazy Bible names. Arana, <laughs> the Jebusite. So David, according to the word of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. Now Arana looked and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So Arana went out, bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Then Arana said, why has my lord, the king, come to his servant? And David said, to buy the threshing floor from you, to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. Now Arana said to David, let my lord, the king, take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look. Here are oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing implements and the yokes of the oxen for wood. All these things, O king, Arana has given to the king. And Arana said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. Now think about this. Now here's the king. He shows up and he's supposed to collect all of these animals for sacrifices. I mean, he, there's, the tools are there. The wood is there uh, for the, the, the altars. 
and it's all there already, all prepared. And Iran, it just says, you're the king. You have the leadership position over all of Israel. I want to honor you, and I want to give this to you, and it's not going to cost you anything, king. It's totally, completely, absolutely free. Most of us as Christians would be like, yeah, it's not going to cost me anything to worship God. We'd be all excited about that. It doesn't cost me anything to worship God. But what does David say to Iran at the very beginning? He says, I've come to you, and I've come to buy it. I've come to buy this from you. And so after Iran is here trying to honor the king, then David, he responds, and this is what he says in verse 24. He says, no, but I will surely, surely, absolutely, no questions asked, I will buy it from you for a price, nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. Worship comes at a price. And it's priceless. The worship that's offered to God from a true heart that desires to bring God glory, that's absolutely priceless. It's not something cheap. It's not something quick. And it's not something easy. It comes at a price. Mary understood this. David, this great worshiper in Israel, understands that worship comes at a price. David writes in the Psalms, he says, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praises, for you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. It's not just the act of burning a bunch of oxen in the Old Testament that brings glory to God. What brings glory to God, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, is what verse 17 says, the sacrifices of God. This is the acceptable worship to God, is of a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. When Mary came to the feet of Jesus, she wasn't coming just quick like, hey, Jesus, what's up? Thanks for saving me. I know I was living a life of despair, but you really showed up and you uh, helped me out. High five, Jesus. Way to go. She wasn't in there real quick and out real quick. She came to bring Jesus something that was priceless, something that was precious. She came to bring Jesus a treasure. She came to bring Jesus something that cost her something. What's the price of your worship? What's the price? We learn so much from what the Bible tells us from these examples. Romans tells us, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg you, in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated. That means you are set apart for God and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service and your spiritual worship. What is the act of worship that God desires from you? It's not just a song. It's not just showing up on Sunday morning. It's not that 35 minutes of worship that, that we do on Sunday morning. God is looking for something deeper than that. He's looking for something more real than that. God is looking for your life. That's what cost you something. And I'll tell you what, that's a price worth paying to give your life as a sacrifice of worship. This is the spiritual act of worship. And the Bible says, I beg you, I beg you, listen to the word of God, the true and the faithful one. Look at these words. Make a decisive dedication, a decision that you will give your life as a sacrifice to God. I mean, he's God. He knows what's going on in our hearts. He knows what's going on with our motives. How do we think that we're worshiping God just by singing a song? How do we honestly think that? When our heart, look at the verse, our heart is not consecrated to God. Our life is not consecrated to God. It's not set apart for God. God will honor and accept the worship of the one that comes before God and says, God, I'm not just bringing you a song. I'm not just bringing <laughs> Excuse me. I'm not just bringing you 35 minutes of worship, God. I'm bringing you my life, everything that I have. I know it's going to cost me friends. I know that it's going to cost me things. I know it's going to cost me places. But God, my whole life is devoted to you. From morning until night, my life is devoted to you. In the middle of the night, my life is devoted to you. My life is a sacrifice of worship. 
If it was just a song, I'd give it, but that wouldn't cost me anything. I think David is on to something here. I think Mary is trying to teach us something here about how priceless worship is. Something else I want to tell you about worship is this. Worship is personal. Worship is very, very personal. It's very intimate between you and God. It really doesn't have a lot to do with anyone else around you because even if no one else is worshiping, you can worship. Your life can be a sacrifice of praise. Worship is personal. We're going to take a look back at our main text in John chapter 12. And the Bible tells us that one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray Jesus, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii, or an entire year's worth of wages, and why wasn't it given then to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, you know, Jesus, he knows the hearts and the minds of the people. There is no pretension with Jesus. He gets right past it all, and he just gets to the heart of the matter. And then this is what Jesus says. He says, let her alone. You're standing here in judgment of this woman and this priceless act of worship that she's bestowing upon me as she's honoring me, preparing for my burial. People are reproving her in the house. I mean, we're talking about a culture of men that were sitting there and the women were not quite allowed the same way that we do in our culture here nowadays. And here's this woman, she busts in and she comes before Jesus and she's offering this incredible perfume that costs, I mean, everyone in the house knows what that perfume costs. And they're saying, oh, my goodness, we could have sold this. What are you doing, woman? And Jesus says, let her alone. Why? Because worship is intimate. Worship is personal. Maybe the Holy Spirit says that to some people, whether we realize it or not, when we stand in judgment of other people's worship. Let them alone. Let her alone. They're worshiping me. I'm God of all the universe, and I share my glory with no other. Let them worship. I thank God for worship. Worship is something that you have complete freedom before God in. It's something that you don't need to be hindered by anyone else or anything else. Amen? You can just worship. It doesn't matter what people think about you. It doesn't matter what other people are doing. You can just worship. Worship is intimate. Worship is personal. God loves worship. He is honored. He's glorified. And your life is radically changed as you worship Jesus. And so this is what Judas is doing. He's trying to judge her worship. And Judas has no comprehension of what's going on here. He doesn't have any idea what's going on because we know that he's just about ready to betray Jesus. Here's this woman honoring him with a year's worth of wages. And Judas is about ready to betray Jesus for 30 shekels of silver. He has no idea what's even going on. But she understands that worship is personal. She understands that worship is intimate. She understands that worship has to cost her something. And she's not just coming to Jesus for three and a half minutes and singing him a couple of verses of a song. She's bringing something that took her an entire year work to make. Some people believe that maybe Mary at some time may have been a prostitute and maybe that she had taken all of her earnings and she just bestowed it in an act of worship upon Jesus. There were, it wasn't just Judas. In, I believe it's uh, Mark's gospel, he explains how there were other disciples that were sitting there. And they were all murmuring among themselves, talking about, what is this woman doing? What is she doing? And maybe it was two, maybe it was three or four disciples. They didn't understand what was going on. But Mary's trying to teach us something. And actually, Jesus said, wherever in the world the gospel is preached, she will be remembered for this. 2,000 years later, what does Judas have? <laughs> but we look at Mary, and people are still remembering this act of worship, this act of intimacy b between her and Jesus Christ. Now, David teaches us something else in 2 Samuel chapter 6. I'm going to show you about worship being personal. 2 Samuel chapter 6. The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 10, David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed the Gittite three months, and the Lord blessed Obed and all of his house, 
And it was told to the king to King David, saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and he brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. How many of you were in Sunday school when you were younger? Did you guys ever have a flannel graph in any of your Sunday school classes? So maybe you remember what the ark looked like. Or maybe have you guys ever seen Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark? How many of you? Come on. How many Indiana Jones fans do we have? Come on. I actually thought I was Indiana Jones when I was little. I had like a little hat, a little cap gun, and a whip. And uh, yeah, okay, we're not going there. I just got kinder struck right there. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so anyhow, Raiders of the Lost Ark, if you, if you, you know what I'm talking about, the Ark of the Covenant, it was this box that had gold that was uh, all around it. It had two cherubims on top. And inside of the box were the Ten Commandments uh, on stone and there was some manna, and there was a rod, the, the rod of Aaron that had miraculously budded. And I don't have time to go into the whole meaning of the ark. But what I want to tell you about the ark is that it represented the glory of God. And wherever the ark of God was, there was great power. And so here we see in this passage of scripture, the ark is for a period of time at this guy's house. His name is Obed. And everything in his life is being blessed. And it says in the Bible that it was being blessed because the ark of God was there. The glory of God, the power of God was there. And if you look back even in First uh, Samuel, in the first couple of chapters, you remember when Samuel was young and he was under um, the responsibility of Eli. And Eli was training to be priest in Israel. And uh, there's a passage of scripture in there that tells us that Eli had these two sons. And one son was Hoph Hophni and Phinehas was the other and they went out to go battle against the Philistines, and they had the Ark of the Covenant with them. But see, they were living in sin, and they were doing all kinds of evil in Israel, and Eli wasn't dealing with it properly, and things were getting out of control, and they both died in that battle. And the Ark got stolen, and then someone came back to tell Eli, your sons got killed in the battle, and the Ark got stolen, and Eli was so brokenhearted by it, he actually fell over dead and broke his neck. And so Phineas's wife found out about this, and she was with child. She was about ready to have Phineas's baby, and she, this is what she called her son. She named him Ichabod. And the meaning of the name Ichabod means that the glory of God has departed from Israel. And so it was because of the ark and because of the sin that was happening with, within uh, Eli's family, and the ark was taken away by the Philistines, and the glory of God has now departed from Israel. So in the Old Testament, they understood the ark represented the glory of God, the power of God. And wherever the ark was, there was blessing. So it's been at Obed's house for a little while now. It's blessed him a whole bunch. And David wants to bring it back into the city. And so that's what's going on here in this passage of Scripture. So in 2 Samuel 6.13, look here what the Bible says. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord, they'd gone six paces. I mean, they went one, two, three, four, five, six, six steps. And then what they did is they sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. I mean, they were excited about this whole ark thing coming back into the city of David. And then this is what David did. I mean, the ark's coming back. The glory of God is coming back. I mean, the power of God is about ready to hit the city. People are going to be blessed by the power and the glory of God. So David's excited about this. And the Bible says that David danced before the Lord with all of his might. I mean, David was like, whoa, the ark is coming back. Yeah, the glory of God. He's coming back. The blessing of God is coming back. Woo! I mean, he put all that he had into it. And we as our Midwestern Minnesotas, Minnesotans were like, oh, God. Yes, we need more of you, Jesus. Jesus. We don't dance. We don't get excited. The Bible says that he did this with all of his might because there was something that was moving inside of him in the spirit. That excited him before God because the glory of God, the blessing of God was coming back. And the Bible says that David was wearing a linen ephod. He didn't have all of his fancy kingly clothes on. Verse 15 says, so David, so exhausted from that right now. I couldn't do that very much. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting. These people were not calm. They were not quiet. They were dancing. They were excited. And they're shouting. They're praising God. And the Bible says that uh, they're shouting with the sound of trumpets in verse 16. Now, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, I mean, David is pumped up about this right now. He's just going crazy. 
The Bible says that as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David. This is her husband leaping and whirling before the Lord. I mean, he's leaping, dancing with all his might. He's whirling. I don't even know what whirling looks like. I'm not even going to try because I feel like I'm going to break something, okay? <laughs> but that's what he's doing. And the Bible says that he's doing this before the Lord. And then look what happens. His own wife looks at him. And the Bible says that she despised him in her heart. That's actually really dangerous to do. It's really dangerous to judge someone else's honest worship. It's actually dangerous. And I'll show you that in a moment. Verse 17 says, So they brought the ark of the Lord. And they set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings. A lot of burnt offerings back in those days. Aren't you glad that Jesus is the final sacrifice? Amen. And peace offerings before the Lord. And when David blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And then in verse 20, the Bible says, then David returned to bless his household. I mean, the people blessed. The glory of God is returned. They're, they're just excited and praising God because of the significance of this event. And then Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, <clears throat> How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. Sense a little bit of uh, sarcasm there? Think she was being a little facetious? Yeah. I mean, she's like, how could you be so undignified, king? I can't believe that you would dance like that and let all the people see how undignified you were. She didn't realize, probably, that he was doing this before the Lord. So then David, he says to his wife, probably without any sarcasm, I don't know, <laughs> it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this, and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Wow. Because she despised her husband in her heart. She despised his worship. Worship is personal. Worship is intimate. You can't sit there and judge someone's honest worship when they're worshiping God biblically. In accordance to God's word, He's given us of his spirit to worship him. Let me show you a couple of things that we can learn about worship and the cost of worship. In that passage of scripture alone, this is like a little mini sermon right here. He shamelessly uncovered himself. When you come before God, that's the way you need to come before God. You need to take away all the shame, uncover yourself, and be spiritually bare before the Lord, okay? Not physically, because physically you're not coming back to abundant life, okay? And you're probably going to spend the night in jail. So you want to make sure that you're doing this spiritually and covering yourself before the Lord. There's nothing hindering between you and God. When I first got saved, one of the songs that really impacted me as a worship leader was the song Unashamed Love by Ten Shuckle Shirt. And the words say, you're calling me to lay aside the worries of my day, to quiet down my busy mind and find a hiding place worthy. You are worthy. I open up my heart. Let my spirit worship yours. I open up my mouth, let a song of praise come forth. Worthy, you are worthy of a childlike faith, of my honest praise, of my unashamed love, of a holy life, of my sacrifice, of my unashamed love. I was so touched by that song because I realized that now I was a Christian. I knew Jesus Christ as my Savior, and the blood of Christ had covered all my sins and transgressions. There was no more shame between God and I. We get so ashamed because of what other people are thinking about our worship. We get ashamed. I told you last week, I know how it feels. I'm a pastor, and I've been in places where other leaders just are not as open worshiping God. And I know that, that kind of oppressed feeling, and you're like, well, I better not do it then. I might offend someone. Man, you're worshiping God. You worship God the way you worship God. You worship God the way you worship God, whether it's in your prayer closet or whether it's in the house of God. You worship God. Worship God biblically, but worship God shamelessly uncover yourself there's nothing for you and i to hide between god you see this is the way god originally made man god originally made man in the very beginning to have complete absolute perfect fellowship with himself and god created us in the life of his image to bring him glory to bring him honor to live a life of obedience to live a life that's faithful to god as god has been faithful to us and so we actually see in 
the Bible in the book of Genesis from the very beginning. This is the way man was created. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. The reason God put him to sleep is he wanted a big surprise. Verse 22, the rib which the Lord had taken from the man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man and they were both naked of the man and his wife and they were not ashamed. There was no shame. Do you know why God get God made women? Because God, after he made man, he's like, yeah, I can do better than this. Come on, girls, that's your opportunity to say amen. Amen. Yeah, I'll say amen to that. Amen. My wife's my better half. Amen. But uh, so here the Bible tells us that they were both naked, man and his wife, and there was no shame. There was no shame between them and God. They had complete fellowship. But then the fall happened. Sin entered into the world. And then what the Bible tells us in the very next chapter, after they had sinned against God, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Wait a minute. Just a moment ago, there was no shame, but now they're hiding themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam, and he said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. All of a sudden, now he was ashamed. And this is the same way that we even get as Christians, because when we start to kind of fall back into darkness and we start to fall into sin, you know what we do? We hide from the presence of God. Whenever a friend of ours speaks something that's true, something that's really in love from the word of God, and we get offended by it, it's because we're trying to protect our sin. We, we don't want to go to a place where the Holy Spirit is really working and moving because if we're really in a place where we might actually get, I don't even want to say the word, convicted, God forbid that we should ever be convicted in church. So what do we do? We try to hide from the presence of the Lord. And we're ashamed because of our sin. We're ashamed of our lifestyle. I've heard people say so many times, well, I can't go to church anymore, Grant. I, I just can't go there. Well, why can't you go to church? Because everyone else is standing around me and they're all singing and everyone's praising God and I just, I've been sinning all week and I just can't be there. That's exactly where you need to be because that's the place you can get healed. That's the place you can get forgiven. That's the place that your life can be transformed. That's, that's the place where you can reestablish your life in truth and get out of the darkness that you've been living in. But that's just what people do. Sometimes maybe you've done that. I know I've done that. You try to get away from where the presence of God is. You don't want to be around people that are intimately worshiping God because it's very convicting because you know you haven't been doing it yourself. But that's okay because we all got to start somewhere. And so we need to learn from God's word. We need to learn from one another. We need to encourage each other and spend time together worshiping God and praying for each other and ministering to each other. So we can grow in our individual personal relationship with God. There's nothing for us to be ashamed of. Jesus Christ has now covered that shame. Amen. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. I can freely come before God and I know that I'm accepted based upon what God's word says about my acceptance. I know that I've been completely justified by faith. And I know that through Jesus Christ, I have been completely set free and absolved of all my sins and no longer are on my account. But now I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ because by faith I've trusted Christ as my Savior. What do I have to be ashamed of? I want more of God. I know what God has done in my life. I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, and I want more of that goodness in my life. And so David, he, he, he was ashamed, and he uncovered himself before the Lord. And he said to his wife, he said, I will be humble in my own sight. See, proud people, they can't worship God because it's always about them. You can't worship God. You don't have the freedom to worship God. And a lot of times, if we're just not worshiping God, it's probably because some, some area of pride or selfishness. If we're not worshiping God, it's probably because of some area of pride or selfishness. And so you might be hearing all this stuff about worship, and you're like, what are you talking about, Grant? I don't even know what you're talking about. It's probably because there's some area of your life that you're hung up on yourself in. And David, he's talking, he's saying, I will be humble in my own sight. Think about Mary when she came before Jesus. She was not coming cocky. She wasn't coming carelessly, casually before Jesus. No, she was coming humbly. I mean, she had to get down on her knees. That's where she had to get down. And she was crying at the feet of Jesus. She was broken. She was humble before Jesus. 
And let me share this verse with you, John chapter 4. This is what, what, what God is looking for from his people. The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is seeking after worshipers. Does God have your heart? Does God have your worship? God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in what? You can't worship God without being in spirit. You can't worship God without being humble. You can't worship God without surrendering yourself to him. You can't worship God unless you truly believe. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's what the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. If we're not believing God by faith, how are we going to honestly worship God? It's so much more than just a song. Years ago, also when I got saved, there was a, a really great song that touched my heart that ties in perfectly with this message. And maybe you heard this song before by C.C. Winans, the, Al the Alabaster Box. Did you ever hear that song? If there was any way that I could have played a video, I would have. But I just want to tell you what the words of that song, the song were. The song says, the room grew still as she made her way to Jesus. She stumbles through the tears that make her blind. Some felt such pain and some spoke in anger. Heard folks whisper, there's no place here for her kind. Still on she came through the shame that flushed her face. Till at last she knelt before his feet. Though she spoke no words. Everything she said was heard as she poured her love for the master from her box of alabaster. I've come to pour my praise on him like oil from Mary's alabaster box. Don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and dry them with my hair. You weren't there the night he found me. You did not feel what I felt when he wrapped his loving arms around me. And you don't know the cost of the oil from my alabaster box. I can't forget the way life used to be. I was a prisoner to the sin that had me bound. And I spent my days and I poured my life without measure into a little treasure box I thought I'd found. Until the day when Jesus came to me and he healed my soul with the wonder of his touch. So now I'm giving back to him all the praise he's worthy of, and I've been forgiven, and that's why I love him so much. You don't know the cost of my oil. You don't know the cost of my praise. You don't know the cost of my oil in my alabaster box. There is not one person in this room that knows the cost of the worship that you bring before Jesus. If they don't know the cost, why would you allow anyone else to judge you? You don't know where Jesus found me. You don't know the sin and the despair in my life. You don't know how far gone I was. You don't know how far Jesus Christ has taken me. You haven't been there hour after hour after hour as I've had to plead before God in His presence. Hours of fasting and prayer. You haven't been with me as I've been reading through the Bible over 10 years and experiencing all the incredible things that Jesus has done in my life. Who are you to judge my honest worship? And who am I to judge yours? Man, worship is intimate. Worship is personal. When you worship God, release yourself before God, and God will do incredible things in your life. I'm going to quickly just share this last point, and I'm not going to get too, too in-depth because we're actually going to be going over this next week. But worship is powerful. This is one of the things we don't understand. And if we don't understand the cost of worship, we're not going to understand the power of worship in our lives. The scripture tells us in the book of Psalms, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Do we realize how valuable worship is in the church? And I'm not talking about just singing songs, but I mean people that are sacrificing themselves to Jesus. They're laying their life out upon the altar and saying, God, this is my life. Take all of my life, all that I have, all that's within me. And the Bible says that God actually inhabits the praises. In the New King James uh, Version, the Bible tells us that uh, he's enthroned in the praises of Israel. 
God is exalted and he's uplifted. And when people come by faith and they surrender themselves to Jesus in worship, the Bible says God is inhabiting their praise. Do you realize when you're singing to Jesus Christ and you're worshiping his holy name, that the Holy Spirit is coming and he's inhabiting your worship? Anything can happen. Anything can change. So many times I've had the enemy surrounding me and I have felt the temptation to sin. I felt the temptation to lust. I've felt that temptation to give in to the enemy, to be bitter, to be angry. I have felt that in my own personal life and I've locked myself in the bathroom and I've worshiped God and prayed and I've told God I will not leave this bathroom until this is relieved from me. I have got to experience that your word is true and that your word is powerful and worship is powerful. It'll change your life. You can't be the same when you encounter God. You just can't be the same. Your life will always be different. Worship is powerful and God comes. He's enthroned on high in the praises of his people. The Bible says praise is awaiting you, O God. Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. Just think about the first part of that verse. Praise is awaiting you. Last week I told you I actually have an expectation. I think the Holy Spirit has an expectation with the series of worship that we're going through. God always has a purpose for everything, amen? These messages are not in vain, so I hope that you would not just allow it to be in vain, but I pray that you would open up your heart to God's truth and that your life would be affected by the eternal word of God. And I said that I have an expectation because I want to see our church become a mighty church that worships God. I mean, I want to see us sing with all our might. Shout. I, I hope. I hope everyone in this community center can hear what's going on in this room. I hope that some brokenhearted people that are going through a divorce or that are going through uh, cancer or that are going through some sort of abuse or they've, they've been just uh, defiled by the enemy or drug addicts or drunks. I mean, there's an AA group that just meets over here. I pray that they'd come in here and get filled with the Holy Spirit of God and that their lives be transformed forever. And that God would set people free from not just one addiction, but all the addictions that the enemy has power and authority over in their lives. I believe that worship has power. I believe that God works and he moves. And this verse, it says, praise is awaiting you, O oh God. One of the things I hope that we learn as a church is that when we come to church, we're all ready to praise God. I told you last week, we, we, we even came up with a name for Missy's car. We call it, what, what do we call it, Nate? The praiseler? The praise blazer? It's the praiseler, Yeah. And so if you're coming with Missy, we said, just tell her to put the worship tunes on because it's time to worship God. We're going into abundant life. Praise is awaiting you, God. Man, I wake up in the morning and it's like, God, all right, I'm ready to worship. I get to church and it's like, I've already been worshiping. I mean, worship isn't just happening on Sunday morning in your church. Worship was happening long before you ever came on the scene. And worship will last way after you and I have departed from this earth. I mean, worship is going on as I speak. It's already happening. And we have this idea like, okay, I have the choice to worship or not. Yeah, you have a choice to join in what's already happening. It's already been going on since eternity past, and it's going to go on forever and ever and ever. I've just chosen to join in it because I know it's got power, and that power radically changes my life. So praise is awaiting you, God, and blessed. You're blessed. Blessed is the man that you choose and you cause to approach you that he may dwell in your courts. And if worship, real worship, I'm talking about the, 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 the valuable worship, the kind of worship that is coming from a life that's surrendered to God, if that's happening in the house, this is what's going to happen. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house. People will walk out of church and they're going to be like, whoa, we met with God. I don't know what's going on in those people, but God is working. God is moving. And that's the kind of church that I pray that God would develop at Abundant Life so when people come, they encounter God and their lives are never the same. And then they got to go tell their friends and say, oh my goodness, you got to come and see. I don't, I don't know what's going on there, but God is working. God did something radical in my life. My life is not the same. Because they're satisfied with the goodness of his house. I'm tired. I'm, I'm going to go over just a few minutes here, okay? I'm tired of all the bad things that we hear about churches. And they gossip over there, and those people are doing this, and those people are doing that, and then this is going on, and that's going on. I long for a church where the goodness of God is in his house, and when people come in, they're satisfied. I mean, needs are met. The, the, the depth of their soul that is just so tormented by the enemy, I mean, something just radically changes because they've met 
with God's people in his house. They've heard truth. Jesus has come. He's, he's revealed himself. He's touched their heart. He's changed them. Well, part of that is praise. Part of that is worship and coming before God. Worship is so powerful. Make a joyful shout to the Lord. All of you lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. When you came to church, did you know that he is God? Did you come thinking like, okay, I'm going to worship God? The Bible tells us it is he who made us. What were you made to do? Worship. Really? What's that? What is worship? Is it really part of our lives? Because the Bible says that it was he who made us and not we ourselves. We are the people of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. Worship is powerful. The Bible tells us that when Mary, when she came before Jesus, she broke that alabaster box, that oil poured down. The head of Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that the odor of the ointment had filled the house. It filled the house. Is our worship, genuine worship, is it filling this house? Are are people sensing the fragrance of Jesus? When we're worshiping Jesus, I mean, are people saying, wait a minute, what's going on over here? Whoa, that smell amazing in the spirit. What is going on? Is the odor being released throughout the house? Because when you worship Jesus, Mary was worshiping Jesus. Would you agree? Everyone noticed. Yeah, some people were offended by it because they weren't worshiping Jesus. But Jesus said that this will be remembered. You will be remembered for this act. As long as the gospel is being preached throughout the world, you will be remembered. People's lives have been changed because of that act of worship. My life has been radically changed by this passage of Scripture because I understand that worship is priceless. I truly understand worship is personal and worship is powerful. God can do incredible things and change our lives. So I pray that God would just release worship in our church. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message from Risen Life. To find more, go to risenlife.net.